We did some survey work through the coalition just to kind of gauge like where some of the municipalities were on the need for more housing in general yeah. um, and attitudes towards affordable housing and things like that. And um, I, I do think that there is an opening there Good. because there's just such a need. I want to give a special thank you to our season two sponsors, MHEB Incorporated, Amish Gazebos, Espen Shade Farms, and Espen Shade Mills. To learn more about our sponsors, visit wsm.org backslash podcast. Hi, I'm Jack Crowley. Welcome to the Restorers Podcast. Uh, we're really grateful that you joined us today and that you're listening in. Today, we're going to be talking about affordable housing and the affordable housing crisis that we're facing here in Lancaster. And really across the country. And I'm really excited to have Shelby Nauman with us. Shelby is the CEO of Tenfold, and she also is one of the co-chairs of the Coalition for Sustainable Housing. And so Shelby is working at this issue from a lot of different angles. Shelby, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's your chance, know, and we're yeah. excited for it. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, uh, for our listeners' sake, uh, tell us a little bit about Tenfold. Uh, you guys are engaged around housing issues from so many different angles. Mm -hmm. And then tell us what the Coalition for Sustainable Housing is. Sure. Tenfold is the um, result of two longstanding nonprofits yes. coming together. Yeah. Um, and we're still trying to get the name out there. So uh, it was the coming together of Tabor Community Services, which um, started in 1968 yes. and was really focused on uh, you know, neighbors that were having trouble finding housing um, by mm -hmm. a woman named Grace Wanger. Yep. Um, and then um, it evolved over time from providing housing to housing counseling um, to um, also, you know, owning rental properties and things like that. Um, and then uh, it was also Lancaster Housing Opportunity Partnership, which had been around since 1994. Okay. Uh, and the, the sort of main program that people probably remember LHOP for um, was the first time home buyer program. Those two organizations came together um, officially in 2021. We became tenfold uh, at that point. And um, so that is part of the reason we have so many different programs yeah. that I can tell and you again, about. <laughs> yeah, again, you, you address housing issues from Everything from people who are experiencing homelessness, identifying needs and helping connect people to resources. Right. Even before you, that, actually, we have an outreach team. Oh, that's true. So yeah. we have um, people that um, th go throughout Lancaster County and connect with people who are unsheltered homeless. Right. And that's, I mean, throughout, like from, you know, Ephrata to <laughs> Paradise, uh, Lancaster City, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing more and more of that out in the county. Yeah. Um, so those folks connect with people and um, try to help get them resources, whether it's IDs, whether it's connecting with other resources resources, right. um, you know, to um, get them into um, sort of a next step situation so they're not living, you know, in their car, right. Right. Uh, in a tent, um, in an uninhabitable situation. Yeah. And you also have a shelter? We do, yes. The TLC, TLC. shelter, yep. which actually um, opened in 1987. We right. currently um, have 52 rooms there. It's a former hotel. The building itself is 114 years old. Yeah. We have 17 beds for veterans. We work closely with Veterans Court through the Lancaster County mm -hmm. Veterans Court. Um, and then we have uh, crisis rooms, um, we have some medical rooms with, called Care Connections with yep. Lancaster General. Um, but we serve about 100 people uh, at wow. a time. Um, usually 40 of those are children, so yeah. families with kids. What's amazing to me is you are kind of that full spectrum because mm -hmm. then you're also working with families uh, around budget counseling and credit right. repair, first-time home buyers, mm -hmm. um, and then you're even investing in developers. Right. So we have a lending program that is – um, what, what I talked about with LHOP, which is yeah. the first time home buyer program, you go through the course, you can be eligible for up to $10,000 in closing cost assistance, mm -hmm. which is really helpful. And then we have the LIFT fund and the acronym is Local Housing Investment Fund and Trust, <laughs> um, where we, uh, it's a wonderful partnership. We're able to um, get investments from the banking community and then in return they get CRA credits. Okay. Um, but we're able to lend at flexible low 
lower than market rates to developers who want to awesome. include affordable housing as part of the, either the full project is yeah. affordable, but a lot of projects it's, you know, um, a percentage yeah. of, of units. I are. love the fact that your organization is able, again, to address things from the very beginning, like from the individual level at the most extreme through those who are kind of more moderate income and are trying to take that next step. Mm -hmm. And you're also addressing the, the creation, the need for creation of housing. Yeah. And so that's just amazing. I, I love Tenfold <laughs> and all the work that you do. Um, and then we both uh, participate with the Coalition for Sustainable Housing yes. and appreciate your leadership there. What is that coalition all about? What are, what's the main in, you know, 30 seconds, what okay. is C4SH about? It's really like, how can we advocate as a cross-sector group of volunteers, it's all volunteers, and come together and support advocacy to create more housing choice. Mm -hmm. So it's like all types of units, all types of price points, yeah. all types of households. Um, yeah. If we want to have a prosperous community, we need to provide that infrastructure. Right, right. Um, because otherwise we're going to, you know, it's, we're going to stagnate. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing. Sometimes when we talk about affordable housing and, and the crisis of the lack of affordable housing that we have, we immediately think of, of housing that's at a cheap rate or mm -hmm. at a lower dollar figure than market rate. But the reality is the crisis exists because we lack housing at all levels. Mm -hmm. And so the C4SH is, is about, um, encouraging development at all those levels and making sure that we have the right housing choice mm -hmm. so that a family who's making $80,000, $120,000 can find an affordable place to live mm -hmm. for them, which may be different than somebody who's, you know, working uh, a lower wage job and only making $35,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Affordable housing is, can be at all different levels. Yes. Um, there are programs that specifically target certain bands, but, um, but we need housing of all levels right. in our community in order to make sure that it's accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. To that end, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to react to a couple kind of statistics and, and, and statements about what's going on in our community right now around affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an article uh, a couple years ago, actually now it's back to 2000 or 2022, um, the Economic Development Company of Lancaster yep. um, did some research around the needs in our in our county, our community, and they found that between 24 and 40 percent of Lancaster County residents are essentially cost burdened because of their housing costs. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I recall this exactly correct, 40 percent of Lancaster County households are paying more than 30 percent of their income for housing and related costs. 24 percent are paying over 50 percent of their income which is way beyond what anybody would say is sustainable mm -hmm. or healthy mm -hmm. uh, for somebody to have to spend that much in order to stay in their housing. What's the environment like out there for people trying to find housing today? One of the other things that that study called out was uh, the very low vacancy rate that we have here, which yeah. is like 4.6%, a healthy vacancy rate which would allow for uh, a continuum, if you will, like people moving maybe from a starter home to their next home, um, people right. that uh, want to downsize, like that continuum is broken because yeah. of the vacancy rate. We are uh, in not in a good way <laughs> in the, the top 5% uh, of highest, I'm sorry, lowest, lowest vacancy, vacancy rate. rates in like – all metro areas of the country, wow. Wow. Um, which, you know, we in Lancaster were like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it was a wake up call. It really to was. Just how hard yeah. It is. Just yeah. To, uh, and why we're feeling this way and why we're, right. we're and, right. and it is a, you know, across the country, um, a problem. Um, but we, this low vacancy rate um, really contributes to people either a, a choosing probably to purchase homes that are beyond their means because mm -hmm. there's nothing in their price point. So that right. contributes as even homeowners to paying more. You know, we've seen rental rates um, jump 14% in the last two years, yeah. and we haven't seen wages um, keep up with that. Right. You know, in order for someone to afford, um, you know, the uh, median, you know, two bedroom apartment, you have to make $20 an hour, yeah. um, you know, and that just isn't yeah. within reach for a lot of folks. So that, and then you see the folks spending 50% of their, their income. Uh, we don't have a great transportation system here. So transportation costs are also a challenge for yeah. folks, um, with inflation, you know, 8% last year, the way it's been, um, 
you know, just people are struggling, you know, mm-hmm. and I know some of our partners at like the food hub and central PA food bank, like they're seeing the demand go up for some of those services as yeah. a ripple effect yeah. to that. It's so there are so many ripple effects yeah. when housing costs go up and, and wages don't and the challenge of, of the lack of mobility, it's across the board. Food banks are seeing more and more people coming and coming more often um, I think that's what we're seeing more. The numbers haven't gone up, but they're coming more often. Yeah. Instead of coming once a month or, or every other week, they're coming every week. Um, and the demand is really high to balance that out with the housing costs. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing I would say is that a lot of times uh, families experiencing homelessness is a bit hidden mm-hmm. because they're doing a lot of couch surfing, maybe you know spending um, some money to stay in a hotel. We've known that that's been a challenge right. for years, but I think that that is becoming more and more common as well. I think that's really sobering. We know that those numbers are significantly higher. When we talk to the school districts um, and their homeless uh, resource teams, Mm -hmm. we know that number is really, really high. Housing is often posed as, you know, homelessness is a housing problem. Mm -hmm. And you and I have had this conversation about housing first and, and that policy driving things. We recognize housing is an important part of it. Um, even as we don't subscribe to a housing first mentality with what we do here at Water Street, we see the need mm-hmm. um, for affordable housing, a price point to get in. Uh, one of the other figures that I think always amazes me is Lancaster County uh, is a community with you know 220,000 households, I think. And the estimate is that we need 10,000 more units of affordable, or maybe it's up to 12,000, I think the latest, Mm -hmm. 12,000 more units of affordable housing to meet the need that exists today. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? And like, how did we get to that Yeah, I think how I've heard um, Michaela Allwine from Lancaster County Housing and Redevelopment Authority talk about it is we know that there are uh, for every one unit that exists, we know there are three more people that would qualify, m- meaning their income would qualify yeah. them for those units. Right. Because we have such um, a low vacancy rate, you know, there are units that were sort of um, naturally occurring low income units right. that are now market rate. Yeah. So I do feel like inventory could help us create some of that. Um, but that's not the only answer. Um, yeah. And then, you know, trying to build affordable units is so challenging. The, you know, LIHTC tax credits, not to get too (laughs) techy about this, but you know, like there's very limited opportunities for that. And and I think that might be valuable for us to talk about, you know, as we're talking about this issue and for our listeners to, to understand there is the naturally occurring affordable housing Mm -hmm. that, that would be affordable for somebody who's making $40,000 a year. $50,000 $50,000 a year. And then there's the the subsidized or the incentivized for developers, the mm-hmm. LIHTC program, the low income housing tax credit, which enables a developer to get tax credits that they make available to a bank for an equity investment. So without getting into all the details of that, the, the state basically provides these credits. Mm-hmm. The banks can buy those credits. It helps a developer build apartment units or townhouses or even small, you know, duplexes at a much more affordable rate and can keep the rents lower. So they can target 50% of median income, 60% of median income. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's that approach, but then there's also the naturally occurring. And I think that's one of the things we often don't think about is how those naturally occurring, the ones where somebody just, they, they bought a couple houses and they can afford to rent it. And they're gonna they're gonna make their profit off it, provide quality housing to to neighbors in the community, um, and make a little income off of it. Mm-hmm. Those are happening less and less mm-hmm. because the market is pushing up so quickly, right. and because there's so few vacancies out there, mm-hmm. and so it becomes this perpetuating cycle. Are we gonna be able to build twelve thousand more units in the next? Not unless we see major zoning changes. You know, I think the statistic in the last 10 years that was also in the EDC study, or I read it somewhere, was that like 78% of what was built in the last 10 years were single family homes. Right. You know, and likely uh, a lot of the zoning requirements, especially outside the city, you know, they're large lots um, for the most part. You know, the county. have a quarter acre. Yeah. The county would love to get us to a density of like seven units per acre because because we want to keep 
farmland, right. but we've got to hit some density targets that we're not hitting. But that also means because we're not hitting those density targets that the, the homes that are being built are more expensive. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if we were able to, um, you know, really advocate for, you know, duplexes and um, multifamily type mm-hmm. housing, um, those would bring costs down um, yeah. and could be more like yeah. middle market um housing options um right, but we're right. we're not zoned for that right now yeah so, so there's a lot of issues that contribute to it i think one of the other maybe kind of realities that people might not be aware of um that is a statistic that i learned just recently is um and i'm, I'm not going to get it exactly right but somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the housing stock in lancaster county is three bedrooms or more but only 30 percent of the households have children under the age of 18. Mm-hmm. And so there's this mismatch of like what families really need mm-hmm. and what's available mm-hmm. with the market going where it is. It used to be like, Oh, I can sell this house and buy one for half the price right? and downsize. But depending on how much equity you have in your home before you downsize, you might end up actually owing more and right. you're, you haven't solved any financial issues by downsizing. Right. And again, this cycle right. continues to perpetuate and, and make it more difficult for younger families, for families on modest incomes mm-hmm. to find affordable, suitable housing mm-hmm. for them. We have to look at creative solutions. Mm-hmm. There have to be other ways for us to create more opportunities for people. And there are some creative solutions. So Yeah, the home share one I think yeah. is really interesting um, on a couple levels because it is that idea that there's a mis- mismatch. So you have maybe an older person who would like to downsize, can't afford to, but they're in this large home. Yeah. There's also you know the pandemic of loneliness mm. <laughs> since Absolutely. the pandemic and especially for older folks mm. and maybe who are have mobility issues and things like that. So this home share model is something um, a couple communities in Pennsylvania have done through their Department of Aging. Um, And it is not like a landlord tenant situation, but it's like a matchmaking situation. It could be a college student. It could be, you know, a mom with a few children and it could be being matched with someone who has extra space Mm -hmm. um, and they do pay some rent or they also like maybe take care of the lawn or they right. still drive and need, you know, the person who lives in the home yeah. could use some, you know, extra help grocery shopping and things yeah. like that. So and there's examples of some curated programs like that. So like yes. Garden Spot Village, I know is one example, right? Mm-hmm. Where they've actually done some of that with, co- I think, college students and seniors sharing housing together. They've done it with seniors and seniors too, mm-hmm. but there's opportunities for that to, way outside the box. Mm -hmm. Um, It's different than most people are like, oh, I have to have my own home. But the realities of what the costs we're facing and the lack of ability to build our way out of it, Mm -hmm. um, to look for those creative solutions. One of the other ones I know that's getting a lot of buzz and hopefully some movement in our community is uh, accessory housing units. Yes. I'm um, so excited. So yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's I, in the new city comp plan that's oh, allowable that's awesome. by right. So that yeah. is awesome. The city's <laughs> doing that. And yeah. we know there's one municipality in, in yep. Lancaster County who's already yep. uh, changed some of their codes mm-hmm. in order to allow. So tell us what is, what is accessory dwelling units and, okay. and how could that help with this issue? Yeah. So an accessory dwelling unit would be on an existing, you know, um, a plot of land that is deeded, um, but if there's extra space, mm-hmm. you could put a unit that uh, has, you know, all the facilities, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom kind of facilities, but could be placed as part of uh, mm-hmm. a property. Um, it could be something that you rent. It could be literally, you know, you have a family member who needs a little extra help um, yep. and lives in that unit. It's East Lampeter Township Correct. that yeah. has, has already approved that. Yep. The city has put it in their comprehensive plan, mm-hmm. so they're, they're intending to move that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, do we see any other movement or at least conversation around that across the county? We did some survey work through the coalition just to kind of gauge like where some of the municipalities were on the need for more um, housing in general um, and attitudes towards affordable housing and things like that. And um, I I do think that there is um, an opening there because there's just such a need. The positive thing is the need, I think people are becoming more aware. It's, it's not just a small group of people who are like trying to raise the alarm. Yeah. It, I think 
we all are sensing that wherever we are in our lives. If we've got children who are, you know, hitting their their twenties, coming home from college, trying to figure out where that first apartment's going to be, mm-hmm. and we remember, <laughs> you know, I remember my first apartment, three hundred twenty dollars for a two bedroom that I didn't need, and it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And it was only thirty years ago. Um, <laughs> wasn't that long ago. (laughs) And now like trying to help my daughter find her first apartment, we could not find anything Mm -hmm. for under $1,200. Thankfully she was able to get into one of those Litec communities Mm -hmm. and find an apartment for her and her daughter. And without that, she would be significantly cost Cost burdened. burdened. And and she's, as she's starting her career, as she's moving forward, now she's gotten a raise and she's doing much better. Mm -hmm. She's going to be able to start looking for that next phase. But now those apartments that were supposed to be $1,200 are now Mm -hmm. (laughs) $1,400. It's like in two years, that's how much a two bedroom has gone Mm -hmm. up locally. And, and if you can find it. And years ago, you know, when we were counseling people, if they were paying $900 a month for rent, we were like, you know, the best way to stabilize your rent, buy a home, (laughs) get a mortgage. (laughs) And now that's not, that's out of range. Yes. You know, so that option is gone. So as we think about how we can at least begin to put a dent into the issue, uh, you know, those creative solutions, there's also the traditional that's been happening for a while. We have some great organizations locally Mm -hmm. who are doing affordable housing developments Mm -hmm. using LIHTC, using other resources to, to make them affordable. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in our community around affordable housing in that way. Sure. Um, so a couple projects that we've supported recently through Lyft, uh, HDC is developing the former UPMC site on College Avenue. Right. Uh, 62 units, truly affordable, um, truly accessible in partnership with yeah. UDS. And that will literally, uh, they've raised enough money that it will be no more than uh 30% of someone's income right, um, right. and able to um, to live there. Uh, it doesn't make a huge dent. <laughs> right. Um, but, and, and they are, they have future phases planned, which are yeah. fantastic. So they're hoping to do over a hundred total in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then, you know, the, it's inter- it'll be interesting to see what happens with the prison site yeah. here in Lancaster. I know that they're starting to look at um, doing a, a comprehensive plan. Right. Um, and I know there. the city's thinking about housing as yes. a potential in that area. Yeah. And the yeah. city's been, um, the city administration has been really proactive in how they're utilizing their funds for affordable housing yeah. um, and trying both on the preservation side, but also in developing more affordable housing. Yeah. No, that's um, great. And then we have chestnut housing yeah. um which is uh out of east chestnut mennonite church and right. your friend of mine chad martin yeah, yeah. <laughs> um we just did a, a ribbon cutting last week for the milburn apartments which yep. will be eight new eight units. units over yeah. there right yeah, yeah. Uh, sitting vacant for four years wow. uh, after a fire um, and the way we work with them is that you know when we're um, case managing folks who come into some of our programs we work closely with them to place them uh yeah. in in some of their units yeah and so um, they're going to also get some supports once they're in the units too they have correct. access yeah. to a case manager working with them potentially and and addressing those issues i know chad's big on that mm-hmm. like definitely because they they keep those very affordable yes um but then making sure that people have that additional support if they do run into struggles yeah so i think with milburn that puts them at 30 okay. uh it, with some other things they have in the works it looks like 10 more units yeah. but they're hoping to get to 100 yeah um, and which is exciting they're and they and they're doing stuff. it small bits yes. at a time so eight here four here mm-hmm hopefully 12 up on Strawberry Hill. Um, And then Habitat is looking to add 30 more in the next few years. They just um, come to, they're close to um, finalizing their uh, capital campaign there, um, which is a huge opportunity um, for folks who um, have the ability to do the sweat equity piece and things like that. Habitat's such an amazing, what a cool program. Yes, (laughs) they are. I just love them. And uh, and I'm going (laughs) to give a shout out to um, Community Basics as well. Uh, Bowsman Apartments Mm -hmm. is actually, I think, starting to rent up here in June. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's another 56 or 62 units Mm -hmm. right on the edge. It's Lancaster Township, Lancaster City, kind of on the border there. Um, So it's exciting to see those things happening. Those projects can take a long time to develop Mm -hmm. Um, from conception and and, and identifying the land and, and having a plan can often take three to five years for those to come to fruition, which Mm -hmm. is why, again, like 
we're not going to be able to build our way out of it quickly. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at other creative solutions. We need to look at other ways to get our community to, to, to create housing at all levels um, so that there is always that, that kind of really accessible, affordable housing for the lower income. Um, our listeners, uh, as they become more aware of this issue and they might be thinking, man, what could I do about this? I'm, obviously, I'm not going to go build 50 units of apartments or mm -hmm. townhouses. I might not own enough land to do an, a, a dwelling unit on my property. How could they get involved? How could they help the situation that we're facing here in Lancaster County? Um, I think a couple ways. I mean, one, uh, you've probably heard people say NIMBY, not in my backyard, yes. but be a YIMBY, a yes in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning if there are projects that are coming, you know, to, you, you know, your, where you live, um, you know, being willing to advocate for those projects to, yeah. to move forward is a big one. Um, and then um, just from a faith-based perspective, you know, we have a lot of, you um, uh, faith-based organizations um, throughout Lancaster County yeah. that are so generous um, and uh, often they own more land than they necessarily need and right, built the right. cost of land is one of the main barriers to keeping things affordable so if there were ways that you know um, some of our faith-based organizations yeah. might consider getting involved that would be awesome yeah I don't have a direction to say go see this person if you're yeah. interested in that but just you know starting to have that but conversation. talk to your pastor Talk yeah. to your leadership team. Have they ever even thought about that? Right. Um, how might they use it? We actually just toasted a conversation with pastors and church leaders a couple weeks ago about how we use our spaces, how we embody our places in the neighborhood to love our neighbors. And one of the takeaways from that is, you know, do you have a parsonage that you're not using for your pastor anymore? Could yeah. that be turned into two or three apartments mm -hmm. to serve families in your community or to help a family? Mm -hmm. Um do you have extra land? And is there something that you could do creatively mm -hmm. to, to help address this issue? You know, part of the reason we're able to get hard to house people uh, into housing is relationships with the, our staff, our amazing staff has mm. built over the years with private landlords yeah. um, and property managers. So if there are people out there who have rental units, right. um, it, it doesn't, it, you know, we're not even saying it has to be way below market rate, but right. just <laughs> affordable yeah. to yeah. people. Kind of look um, at that line. I mean, yeah. we, don't, we don't have to follow market tra trends and maximize. Right. If you've paid off that mortgage, how much do you need to make right. on that rental property? Yeah. And could you afford to make it affordable? Yeah. Um, that would be wonderful. And t for us, the great thing about it is that our, when we place people, it comes along with case management. Yep for the most part. So you have us as a partner working with that tenant. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so there's lots of little things that can be done. Yeah. And, and um, just encourage our listeners to think and pray about how you might be engaged in this. Um, we know the impact, like the trickle down effect of the lack of affordable housing yeah. is putting more burden on Water Street mm -hmm. uh, for our shelter services, our residential for TLC for the food hub running their shelter. Um, just, we see it all across the board yeah. and, um, it's, it's a problem that our community has to own together and we have yeah. to address together. Yeah. And so I really appreciate Shelby, you taking the time today Absolutely. Thank for us you. to talk about this. Hopefully uh, there are some new insights. Maybe you learned something new today. Um, hopefully you're encouraged that it's a huge problem, but there are some small steps we can take together to advocate, um, to look at creative solutions in our own neighborhood. And uh, hopefully we can begin to turn the tide a little bit around this issue. So yeah. thanks, Shelby. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. We really appreciate you taking the time and joining us on the Restorers podcast.